Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started as people are coming through the door. If you could stand for our first hymn, and it's uh, number 406, My Hope is in the Lord. Let's stand together. this glorious Sunday morning, it is my pleasure to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this worship service. And for those of you who are visiting and maybe in the area for a summer vacation type thing, then uh, it's great. It's great you're here. Uh, we, uh, we welcome you uh, and uh, hope you uh, are blessed and filled with uh, what will happen in this worship service. And for those of you who are regular attenders and members, um, it's good that you're here and that you've, you've given up uh, a, a beautiful Sunday morning uh, to be with us in, uh, in God's house. Um, we've got a busy, a busy Sunday ahead of us here. Um, so a couple of things to get, get taken care of. Um, these cards in the pews are for anyone to just let us know who you are and what we can, um, what we can do to serve you in, 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 in God's name. Uh, if you have a prayer request, if you have a need, please fill this out and bring it to the welcome table in the foyer between the two turrets. Um, also, if, uh, if you're not on our email list and you don't have a, uh, a computer that uh, We'll send you all of our activities. We have these newsletters that are also available. Uh, it spells out everything that's going on in the church with dates and times and schedules and all the good stuff that's currently going on in the church. So that's, um, that's available to you as well. Well, here we are. We're on the, uh, we're on the eve of uh, VBS, which starts first thing tomorrow morning. And it's just an amazing thing. Thousands of hours have gone into uh, not only the physical preparation that you see around the church, but just people praying about getting involved and getting uh, plugged in and, and, and uh, accepting uh, their role in uh, the events of the week that are coming. And um, 
please uh, continue to be in prayer for that. And um, there are just a couple of other things that, uh, that we could use to uh, just to fill in you know, a couple of, a couple of blanks. One, we need a small uh, fold-up tent, uh, fold-up uh, enclosure type thing, the, uh, the patio type tent. Just a small one for the registration desk so that those folks stay out of the sun. Two, the arts and crafts people just could use some more help. Um, Monday through, through uh, Thursday, it's really just, you know, an extra body to help make sure that everything gets done in, in, in the very short time that they have to do it. And there's one more thing. Oh, um, crafts. Oh, they need help with registration tomorrow because that's when we get all of the kids in for the first time. Uh, registration goes on the entire week, but um, if, the, if, if someone is available tomorrow morning first thing for the registration, that would be great. Um, after the service today, the Voice of Calvary um, team will be showing a, a slideshow and we'll hear some testimony of some of the kids and adults possibly that um, took part in that. It's another big, big ministry, folks, and um, you know, we don't want to let that, that event pass without everyone having an opportunity to see just what God did in these lives in that week, you know, a thousand miles away in, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. So <clears throat> hot dogs will not be served until after, no, I'm just kidding, but um, <laughs> You know, hold off on the hot dogs, stick around for a few minutes, and just hear, um, hear, hear what people have to say about uh, what happened um, in Jackson. Um, oh, uh, one other thing is that, um, you know, this VBS thing, it's, it's an all hands on deck thing. Um, we've got cross committee stuff going on between CE and outreach and the worship committee and just, it's just an incredible thing. And this is probably the, the singular most um, uh, that's the word I'm looking for. It, I think Eisenhower and the, and, the, and the Normandy invasion was like the biggest single human endeavor, and I think VBS at Trinity Church comes in a close second. <laughs> so, so for those of you who, whose names aren't on the list of you know, a teacher or a volunteer for the rec or whatever, you do have an important role. Number one, you can be praying for these, these people throughout the week. But two, on Thursday night, we have a gathering here where it just all kind of comes together. And we see, and again, we see and celebrate exactly what happened. And then afterwards, we get to visit with uh, the families who uh, sent their children to VBS. So if you're looking to get involved and looking to support uh, VBS, that's a great way. Just, just come here on Thursday. I think it's 7 o'clock. Um, place is just packed with kids and energy. Uh, we serve ice cream in the parking lot afterwards. And um, just come and, and share and, and get to know somebody and, and uh, share the love that we, uh, that we have here at uh, Trinity Church. Okay, Tim, I'll turn it over to you for the call to worship, please. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together for the call to worship from Psalm 5. Bend your ear and listen to my words, O Lord. Hear the deep cry of my heart. In the morning, listen for my voice. In the day's first light, I will offer my prayer to you and wait for your answer. You are not a God who smiles at sin. You cannot abide evil. And yet I, only by your loving grace, am welcomed into your house. I will turn my face toward your holy place and fall on my knees in reverence before you. Let those who run to you be glad they did. Let them break out in joyful song.
And it's only by your grace, by your love, that that happens. Open our eyes to that um, so that we can be aware with every moment of your constant and eternal redemption. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. Center for Vacation Bible School, and uh, the theme verse is 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 57, that says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll be praying for the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do in Vacation Bible School. And I also want to pray for uh, ice cream scoopers. Yes, we pray about every little detail. We need, we need 10 more ice cream scoopers, all right? So if you, if you got a, a good strong hand, either, either one, and be able to scoop some ice cream, it's a, it's a, it's a great job. And uh, sign up in the foyer at the welcome table, and once we get 10, we're golden. So uh, if, if God's speaking to your heart about that, uh, sign up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you for the privilege of being called your sons and daughters of the kingdom. And Lord, your grace has planned it all. We thank you for your saving grace, your sustaining grace, your sanctifying grace, and the grace that we need to live an overcoming life in Jesus Christ. We do pray for uh, Vacation Bible School outreach. We thank you, Lord, for all the volunteers and for all the hard work that has gone into the preparation for this. But, Lord, unless you come down and break forth uh, and open the hearts and the lives of these children and all our hearts, our work will be in vain. We acknowledge that our dependency is upon you, not taking confidence in our own strength and ingenuity, but looking to you to bring about the victory. And through Jesus Christ, we know that we will see great victory won, lives being changed and transformed and children accepting Christ and taking steps of faith, uh, perhaps calling some children to the mission field Lord, uh, raising money for the the Alice Thompson um, School in Brazil. And Father, uh, so many forming new friendships and more relationships uh, between the staff and volunteers. So we pray for each aspect of this year's VBS. We pray for those who take the pictures to help keep the memory of Vacation Bible School alive, for our craft teams that the crafts that they do will help solidify the lessons learned in the Bible classes. We pray for the kids to find out about VBS and come to learn about Jesus and draw the children from towns all around us. We pray for kids who don't know Jesus to, to come and to bring a friend. Pray for good weather, for all the sessions, for joy and peace and your rich grace for all the leaders who will serve We pray that a VBS will proclaim your word clearly. We ask for extra stamina 
for the adults and kids in Vacation Bible School, especially on, on the fourth and fifth days as we begin to, to wane a little bit. So we pray for sustaining strength and stamina uh, from start to finish. And Lord, thank you in advance for how you'll be working. And we pray for uh, the drama that you would use that and for the musicians and the songs that are sung and the lessons that are taught. Father, the snacks that are given, each aspect, Lord, may you be glorified and may your kingdom be proclaimed. Father, we, we ask a continued healing for those in our, in our membership that need your healing hand. We think of Patty Golden, just had surgery this week, uh, continue to bring healing to her shoulder. Uh, Father, thank you for your hand upon her. We ask for others that are facing injuries for healing and restoration, for strength and courage and endurance. And Lord, we ask that uh, uh, through these times of infirmities, that in our weaknesses we would see your power manifested in our lives. Hear us as we now sing unto you the Lord's Prayer. Our children are dismissed for kinder time at this hour. And as they're going, we'll prepare ourselves for singing uh, the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, uh, number 379. Now, the woman who wrote this, the story about her is listed in your program. Uh, our children will be mem memorizing verses of scripture this week. And as you look at the story of Frances Havergill, she, uh, was, she memorized the entire New Testament, as well as the Psalms and Isaiah and all the minor prophets. She probably would have finished the whole Bible, but she only lived to the age of 42 before she died. She learned Greek and Hebrew and Latin, and English, and German, and some other modern languages. You say, wow, she must have, what, what ambition. She must have been spry and full of health. Actually, she wasn't. She was a very sickly woman. She was very frail, and spent much of her time recovering from injury. But what an inspiration as you read her story, and how she writes this hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, consecrated Lord to thee. So as we sing it, may we give our lives fully to the Lord in consecration and reflect upon the woman who wrote the lyrics to this hymn. Larry?
God's Word can be found on page 555, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, on page 555. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve... There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you. So he did what the Lord had told him. And he went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning... And bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Now turn to chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, on the next page. Chapter 18, 1 to 4. After a long time, the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. And so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. And now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. And when Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. And I'll continue on verse 16 to 42 on the next page. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel and meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us and let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call in the name of your God, and I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people said, what you say is good. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call in the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bowl given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. And so they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. And midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, and no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then... Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. And Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, You shall be, your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sayas of seed. And he arranged the wood, 
cut the bowl into pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. And do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it the third time. And the water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let anyone get away. And they seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the, the sound of a heavy rain. And so Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. We'll continue in our uh, New Testament reading. It comes from James chapter 5. Verses 16 to 18, which can be found on 1885, James chapter 5, 16 to 18. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. And our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 4, 24 to 26, on page 1596. Luke chapter 4, 24 to 26. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. The word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Wesley, for the reading of God's word. Let's pray as we get be, as we start. And uh, just to let you know, we do have a sermon outline for you um, to help you in, in following along on pages 10 and 11 uh, today on the prophet Elijah. Heavenly Father, thank you for the scripture. Thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this prophet, this fiery prophet of yours. And Lord, as we now reflect and study his life, we pray that uh, his example will inspire us to live our lives boldly and courageously for you in our time and in our culture. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we, in Hebrews 12, we've been seeing that the God's word says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles let us run with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us. And today's cloud of witness that we're looking at to inspire us in running our race with perseverance is the prophet Elijah. I call him the fiery prophet Elijah because as you look through his, his life, you'll see fire all throughout uh, his ministry. And uh, well, Elijah served as a prophet in the ninth century BC in Israel. Um, when wicked King Ahab was the, the ruler of the king of Israel to the north. 
Um, First Kings says that wicked King Ahab's evil eclipsed all of that of the kings before him. Let that just sink in a bit, all right? His evil, his wickedness, far eclipsed everyone before him. He was that wicked, and yet he was called to be the king of Israel. He married Jezebel, the daughter of the Sidonians, and set up an altar for Baal worship uh, that he built in Samaria. And part of their worship was to worship the Baal gods. And there's a little statue there for you on the screen in front of you uh, of the Canaanite storm god, Baal. Uh, They believed that he controlled the weather, he controlled the clouds, he controlled the rain. You can see where this is going. When the judgment is upon the nation of Israel with no rain, it's a direct uh, condemnation of their worshiping this god Baal. Well, King Ahab also made an Asherah pole. Ashtoreth was the Canaanite mother goddess of love and fertility. And so they they looked to her for prosperity. They didn't look to God. They looked to her to bring uh, fertility to the land, fertility to the family, to bring prosperity to them. They say, why should we turn to God? Let's go to, uh, to this. And they had this pole or this tall figure that they would worship. Well, just as Solomon had erected a temple to the Lord in Jerusalem, now King Ahab... And the northern ten tribes of Israel, uh, he erected this pagan temple to Baal in Samaria around 874 B.C. Imagine now that you are in a theocracy in which God is reigning, and you are the appointed king, and you say, we're going to build a temple to the Baal gods instead of that. So it gives you an idea of the wickedness and the evil of Ahab and of his wife Jezebel. Well, in the midst of this very dark time in Israel's history, spiritually filled with apostasy, with idol worship, God sent the prophet Elijah to the people to turn their hearts back to God. Turn away from these idols and turn to Yahweh. Elijah the Tishbite, uh, the courageous prophet of God to Israel calling a nation to turn away from Baal worship and trust and obey Yahweh. His mission from God was to implore the nation of Israel to turn their allegiance uh, to him and to trust in him as the one true God. The prophet of God, Elijah, prayed that it would not rain. And the Bible said it didn't rain for three and a half years. Well, that judgment of God was upon the people of Israel for their worship and trust in the storm god Baal, who was powerless to bring rain. And so there's a great drought upon the land. Well, with that bit of introduction, we now go into uh, looking at the man Elijah as an inspiration for us in living our lives as Christ followers. Well, number one, Elijah and the drought sent by God for Israel's idol worship And we see that in 1 Kings 17. So you may want to have your Bibles open to 1 Kings 17 as we look at that part of Scripture uh, as we get started. Well, we read, looking in the first six verses of, of 1 Kings 17, that God has sent Elijah east of the Jordan to the river Cherith, where he feeds Elijah twice a day. Now, how does he feed him? It's remarkable what he does. He commands the ravens to bring uh, meat and bread in the morning and in the evening. It's interesting uh, how that is. If you would see a, a flock of ravens in the sky, you would think, well, there's probably a dead carcass down there, a scavengers. And is searching for uh, this prophet Elijah. It could have been very good camouflage for sure, saying, oh, where is he? Well, we know he's not there because that's probably something dead is there. But God was using the ravens. Now, during this time period, uh, bread was very short. It was very scarce because it was a drought. And so people didn't have enough to eat. There's great famine. 
And to have meat, only kings would have meat once a day. And even that would be a huge treat. Most people didn't have meat at all, maybe once a week. But God was providing Elijah at his table bread in the morning and meat, and bread in the morning, uh, and, and meat in the evening, and water to drink. Tremendous example of God's provision for his prophet Elijah. Well, next we see that the brook dries up. And verses 7 to 16 in the text, Elijah is sent by God to a widow at Zarephath for food. Now think about this. If God was saying, okay, this is where you are to go to for food, would you think you go to a poor widow who was about ready to die, in which her son was also ready to die? She had no, no food, and she was poor, and she wasn't even a Hebrew. She was from Phoenicia, right in the heart of Baal country. But that's exactly where God says you are to go. Go to this woman at Zarephath, and I will feed you, I will care for you through her. So first he feeds the prophet Elijah through the ravens, then he uses this woman, not a Hebrew, not a uh, God-fearing woman, uh, but this widow at Zarephath. Well, God says he'll provide for his servant through this unlikely source. And Elijah goes. He goes in obedience. When God says, this is where you are to go, he goes in obedience. And it's a great example to us. Even when God says, this is how I'm going to provide for you in an unusual way, you say, no, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense to me. But we go. We go in faith. God says, I want you to, to do this. I want you to teach this class. I want you to oversee this work. You say, but it doesn't make sense to me. But I will go. And Elijah goes. He goes in obedience. And there he finds the widow at Zarephath uh, in Phoenicia. Um, and uh, she's gathering up some sticks. And, and, he, and, he, and he tells her, bring, bring me a little water and a morsel of bread. She says, as the Lord your God lives, she recognized that he is a Hebrew, recognized that he's a prophet, and this is his God. So she says, as the Lord your God lives, I have only a few hands of flour, a little oil. I'm going to gather a few sticks, make my final meal, and then I'm going to die. Elijah says, do not fear. Uh, go make bread as you planned, and uh, and bring the first bat batch to me. For God is not going to let your flour run out, and he's not going to let your oil to be empty until rain returns to the land. So you go. And amazingly, she goes. She puts her faith in Elijah, her faith in the God of Elijah. She goes to make the bread for him, even though she knew it was all she had. She gave her last bet. Incredible story. And so as she trusts in the God of Israel, God gives this miracle of replenishing flour and replenishing oil. And next we read in 1 Kings 17 that the widow's young son suddenly dies. Now she looks to Elijah and says, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing my sin to remembrance? So she sees the death of her son as God's judgment against her for her sins. So she understands that she's a sinner. She understands that she's an idol worshiper. She's not a, a godly woman, but she has this cognizance that there's, there's a judgment uh, that will take place. And now she sees that her son, that perhaps this calamity was uh, brought on by God's judgment. Well, Elijah took the boy from her. And he took the boy to his, his chamber, his upper chambers. He laid him on his bed. And then uh, uh, let's look at 1 Kings 17, 21 and 22. The Bible says he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. The Lord's life returned to him and he lived. This is the first example of someone raising someone from the dead in the Bible, Elijah. And he raises this young boy from the dead. This, uh, uh, this miracle would be repeated by Jesus, who performed several times 
uh, raising people from the dead, including his own resurrection. Well, when the widow's only son was raised from the dead, she said this, Now I know that you are a man of God. The word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You are a man of God. The word that you speak is true. The miracle testified to her that God's word was true, and he was a true prophet of God. You would think that would be the case for everyone, wouldn't you? To see a miracle like that, you would see... Now they understand, but we'll see as we go through Elijah, there are people that see tremendous miracles and still do not believe or trust in God. Amazing. But this woman, she does. Well, she's not a Jew. She's in the heart of Baal worship, and yet she's like an outsider, if you will, as we see, and she comes to faith in Je uh, Jehovah. Well, now in chapter 18, God tells Elijah he's about to send rain in the land, and he is to go to King Ahab. Uh, he finds Obadiah, a uh, prophet, and asks him to set up the meeting with the king. And uh, uh, while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah was hiding God's prophets in two caves of 50 each, and Elijah meets up with him. Uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead to... Now, verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, troubler of Israel, uh, Israel and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord? No, I'm sorry. Is that you, troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Imagine now, all of this drought, King Ahab says, it's Elijah's fault. I don't take responsibility for this. He's the one. You're the troubler. Elijah says, you got it all backwards here. The fact is, because of your Baal worship, because of your sin in leading this nation away from God, that's why the, this drought is occurring. You are the troubler of Israel. And he corrects it. Well, with that, we launch into the second uh, point I'd like to make about Elijah is the contest that he has on Mount Carmel. And that is in 1 Kings 18. This is probably the, the story about Elijah that's the most familiar to us and I certainly do not want to skip by it. It's very significant, as they all are. The challenge of Elijah to wicked King Ahab and his 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, we see that in verses 16 to 25. Now, Mount Carmel is the scene of the contest, all right, between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Imagine it in your mind, the odds here. One prophet against close to a 1,000. Would you take those odds, 1,000 to 1? Would you take those odds, 1,000 to 1? If God's on your side, you better take those odds because it's the right odds. If God be for us, who could be against us? So Elijah meets up with the prophets of Baal who sit at Jezebel's table and Ahab's table and summons Ahab to Mount Carmel along with the prophets. Contest is set up in which two bulls are sacrificed and cut up, and they call upon their gods. And the one who answers with fire is the true God. Well, they said, well, you're right in our wheelhouse here because we believe in the god Baal, and he's the one that brings the clouds and the lightning and the fire from heaven. We're on. And it's right in the, in the center of Baal worship on this mountaintop. They say, wow, uh, the odds are in our favor. We will take you on. And it's a contest that takes place. Well, looking at verse 21, the Bible says, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Now, this Hebrew word waver is literally dance, all right? You dance around about this, you dance around about that. And there's a little irony here and some wordplay, really, because then these prophets of Baal start 
dancing around to try to bring their God, Baal, to, to come down and bring the fire. So he says, how long will you waver or dance between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. They were quiet. They were Baal worshipers. They knew they shouldn't be, but they didn't know what to say about this, so they just clammed up. Well, verses 26 to 29, we see the prophets of Baal have their turn. Uh, from morning till noon till evening, they dance around and they start to cut themselves. They mutilate themselves. Now, God says, don't be like these other nations that cut themselves to try to bring about God's, God's, uh, their God's favor. He said, oh no, just pray and call upon the Lord. And so they did this, and, and they would cut themselves, and the blood would flow, and, and, and they would start to dance around. And, and then in this, with panache, Elijah just kind of taunts them a little bit and says, what's going on? Maybe you have to speak louder. Maybe they're sleeping. Maybe you have to do something to kind of urge them off. And, and, he's, and he's certainly making a point. Uh, and then finally it's the time for the evening sacrifice and Elijah said, it's my turn. It's now God's turn. And as you look at the text, you see that he begins by repairing the altar. So there was an altar to God that had fallen in disrepair and was disused. And he takes 12 stones and he puts them around. Now why 12 stones? For the 12 tribes of Israel. Why not 10? Because this was, this was the north. This was, this was Israel. And it was a divided kingdom between the 10 tribes and the two. He said, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's a united kingdom. It's God's kingdom. And he puts the 12 stones around. And then after he puts the, uh, the bowl on, on that and the fire, he digs a trench around it. And he has these jars. And he has, uh, and he took uh, three jars, uh, four jars, and filled them with water and pours it on. And then he says, do it again. Do it a third time. So there's 12 jars of water, again, symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he pours it out upon this, this uh, these bull and, and, and upon the wood. He didn't want the people to say, oh, it's by sleight of hand that the fire came. He wanted to make it very, very clear that when God answers by fire, this water will not impede it in any way. And so uh, uh, then he prays, he prays. Look at verse 36 of your Bibles. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant. I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you are Lord, our God, and you are turning their hearts back again. And then the Lord reveals to his people with fire that he truly is the one true God. He answers with fire from heaven, licking up the water, licking up the wood, licking up the stones, the sacrifice, and even the soil around it, the fire comes down, consumes it. What do you think about that? Do you think that would be convincing? How many of you would be convinced that God is truly God? There's some real diehard skeptics in this group. <laughs> all right? That's all right. That's okay. There, the people believed that God was true. He was truly the Lord. But not Ahab. King Ahab, even after seeing this, does not believe and turn to God. Amazing. Well, thirdly, Elijah, as a mighty man of intercessory prayer. We've already seen that Early on, he prayed that it would not rain, and, and it did not rain. We see that repeated in James 5 as well. 
He played, prayed earnestly it would not rain upon the land. For three and a half years it didn't rain, and now God is saying, I'm going to bring rain. The time is up. And Elijah begins to pray for rain. He says to King Ahab, go, for there's the sound of heavy rain. Well, he's listening. Where is the sound of heavy rain? There's not even a cloud in the sky. But he says, God's going to bring the rain. And what does he do? He goes and puts his head between his knees and he prays. He asked his servant to go and to look for a cloud. And he says, is there a cloud yet? No, there's not. He prays again. Is there a cloud? No. He prays a third time and a fourth time and a seventh time. The number of completeness. And he says, there's a cloud about the size of a man's hand coming up over the sea. This, of course, would be the Mediterranean in Phoenicia, right on the coast. And he sees this cloud the size of a hand. And, and he stops and says, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. And now Elijah runs ahead of Ahab and his chariot in the power of the Lord. Do you like that picture? I love that picture. There's, there's Elijah as an old man, and uh, it's also the cover of your bulletin if you can't see it, all right? Uh, and, and he's running in the power of the Lord, in the strength of the Lord, all the way to Jezreel. Well, you know me by now. I, I want to know how far he ran. I want to know the distance. That, that's, that's, that's in my wheelhouse. And it was about 16 miles from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. He ran ahead of this in the power of the Lord. That's awesome. Well, this week I was listening to the news of a woman from Maine, 65 years old, a grandmother, who just swam successfully the English Channel. Tremendous, tremendous. And I said, wow, I want to see uh, the body of this, this grandmother. Must be an incredible uh, athlete. And she's an overweight grandmother. And I said, really? And she, she says, that I'm just an overweight grandmother. And yet, she did this incredible feat. And I said, what a super athlete. Well, Elijah wasn't a super athlete. He was just a man like you and I probably older at this point, and yet the power of the Lord came upon him. He had the strength to run that, that distance, not just run, but run fast ahead of this. Now, this is another testimony to Ahab that God is the God, the true God. He gives him this power to run it. Does Ahab repent and say, wow, I saw the fire, I saw the rain, now I see this guy running ahead, uh, God, you must be God. He still doesn't repent, even with all of these miracles that we see again and again. Well, James says that he was a man just like us. Despite the great triumph of Elijah over the false prophets, despite his faith and, and his, his running in the power of the Lord in this way, yet he had his moments of, of fear as well. And right after this case, uh, Queen Jezebel was undaunted, and she utters a curse formula promising to kill Elijah on the site. Wicked King Ahab saw the Lord's power demonstrated again and again. He doesn't restrain his wife. He doesn't correct his wife. He just says, okay, honey, go with it. And he just goes with it. And she says, I'm going to put him to death. And so Elijah runs. He's afraid. He knows that her threat is a credible one. She's a wicked, bloodthirsty woman, an evil woman who's an idol-worshiping woman, a woman of power, who has incredible power, unchecked. So he says, this is a credible threat. It's not just blowing spoke. And he runs. And he takes off. And, and then he goes under a broom tree. And he lays down. And God uh, provides bread for him to eat and cooks it on the coals. And, and he travels 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. And there he goes to a cave. And there he's waiting and God appears in a still small voice. And, and he's afraid. And there uh, he says, he, God says, what are you doing here? What are you here for? In other words, I haven't sent you to this place. He's running away. He's, he's, he's a person like us. He had his moments. And he said, I'm the only one left. I'm the last prophet left, and Jezebel is coming after me. 
And he said, no, you're not. I have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Sometimes we feel like we're all alone. There's no one in the university who's a Christian. There's no one at the workplace who, who's a Christ follower. And we feel like, I'm all alone. You're not alone. God has believers all over the place who have not bowed the knee, bowed the knee to the gods of this age, but are truly trusting in God alone and in Christ Jesus for salvation. Well, God speaks to him. He's a man just like us. James 5 says, he prays and God answers. James 5 says to pray, turn sinners from their ways, confess your sins one to another. For the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Well, we see his prayer, Elijah prays with faith and intensity for the widow's dead son that we've already seen in 1 Kings 17. We see uh, Elijah prays to God, putting his trust in his divine power and sovereign control over the earth in 1 Kings 18 at Mount Carmel, how he prays against all great odds. He was a man just like us, and we're called to pray and to follow his example as intercessory prayer warriors. Well, fourthly, I'd like to conclude with Elijah's glorious end taken up by the Lord in a chariot of fire from 2 Kings 2. Certainly, uh, I don't have time to go into this, but it's a great contrast to the, to the wicked end of Jezebel and the wicked end of Ahab and how they die. And I'll trust uh, that story to your reading. But here we find that his end is taken up in a chariot of fire. Looking at verse 11 of 2 Kings 2. Elisha and Elijah, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. He took hold of his garment and tore it in two. So Elijah is taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Elisha saw this. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah. He struck the water with it and divided it, just as Elijah did. And the spirit of, e of Elijah, God's spirit, is now upon Elisha. And he does various miracles. Well, the spirit of Elijah is uh, in John the Baptist as well. Malachi 4, 5 says, Before the Messiah comes, the uh, one of the spirit of Elijah will appear and uh, it will turn the nation back to God. And Jesus said, John the Baptist was the promised Elijah to come. The Jews today in the Passover have a chair that they put there uh, for the prophet Elijah, waiting for the coming of Elijah before the Messiah has come. But he's come. The prophet Elijah has come in John the Baptist as this prophet to come. And furthermore, Elijah reappears with Moses at the transfiguration in Matthew 17. Well, here's the final challenge to give you all of this history. How do we apply that in our lives. Well, first of all, will you be like Elijah, courageous, taking your stand for the Lord, even though the odds may be against you, a thousand to one or more? Will you be strong and courageous and say, as for me and my household, we will serve God? Will you? Will his his legacy inspire you in that way. Secondly, will you look to the Lord to provide for you food and water, knowing that God may use unusual means to do that, to provide for you and your family as you trust in him. Trust in him. He will provide. And thirdly, will you give yourself to intercessory prayer? I know many of you are prayer warriors in this church. I couldn't preach without you praying for me every day. 
Susan and I were talking this week and said, you know, our ministry would be a complete failure. Our lives would be a complete failure without the prayers of God's people at Trinity Church and other churches where we've served. And I would say, absolutely. We desperately need the prayers of one another. Will you pray for the people of this church? Will you pray for your community? Will you pray for this nation? Will you pray for the world? That God would break forth and turn the hearts of people to himself and reveal himself through mighty deliverances like he did in the days of Elijah. Pray. And fourthly, will you reach out to the outsider, a person who is outside of God's covenant family, like the widow at Zarephath, in ways that God will use you and perhaps that outsider would come to faith in Christ and say, I now believe that your God is the true God and what you speak is true and I trust in God's word. Let's pray. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand. Oh, Father, we know there's so much more that could be said about this fiery prophet, Elijah. And yet what we've already gone over is ample to inspire us to live our lives for you. Grant us courage and strength to not let the world squeeze us into its mold not to become compromisers, dancing back and forth between becoming a Christian and following Christ, becoming a kingdom follower and dancing around, I'm just gonna follow the world. I'm just gonna follow the gods of this age. I'm gonna follow prosperity by a different means. Lord, help us. Give us that fervency in our prayers. Give us that confidence in you. And Lord, when we face huge obstacles, may this example of Elijah, man just like us, filled with the Spirit to do great things that weren't possible in our own strength. And Lord, when we look back and see how you've used us, we'll say, God, you're an amazing God. You're an amazing God. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, may this man that we will meet in heaven someday, his, his example be an inspiration to us to run the race that you've set before us with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and we'll give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you.
to give you this final charge from 1 Corinthians 16. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Love for God. Love for others. Love for his word. Be strong. God bless you.